My name is Shelvia Dancy. I am an adjunct mass communications instructor at NCCU. Um, since I was 17 years old, I've been working as a journalist. My full-time job is working as a TV news reporter and anchor, um, and I also have a law degree. And I bring that experience to the classroom as a mass comm instructor at NCCU. Um, I reported for CNN, the Discovery Channel, covered a homicide investigation for some networks. I worked in local television in Raleigh, in Memphis, and before that I was a newspaper reporter, writing for the Washington Post and LA Times and working in Washington DC as a national correspondent. Um, and also worked as a newspaper reporter in Syracuse while I was getting my master's in newspaper journalism, which seems like an archaic degree at this point. Um, but before I went to Syracuse, I was a student at NCCU, which is one of the reasons why I was so excited to do this project, to um, be in the classroom where it all began for me, working at the radio station, working at the newspaper, invariably when I teach the mass communication classes to the next generation of students, we hit a part that's not in the textbook when I start talking to them about the history of journalists um, in our country. And there are some names that I think they should know, but oftentimes they don't know. Every now and then they'll have a passing acquaintance with Frederick Douglass, as most people do, but there are some names that I just think you shouldn't walk out of a journalism program unless you know Ida B. Wells, unless you know Russ Roman Cornish, like that just, I would be not doing my duty as a teacher if I didn't teach you those things. One of my favorite uh, moments in the classroom is when I started uh, teaching this, adding this to my intro to mass comm class. A student came to me later at the end of the semester, told me she had a new cat, and her cat's name was Ida in honor of Ida B. Wells. And I felt like I'd done my job as an instructor. So, one of the reasons I was so excited about the digital project is I thought this is a way to sort of make an online textbook to include some information that I feel like should be in these textbooks that isn't always there. Or if it's there, it's sort of mentioned quickly and then the textbook moves on to something else. And I felt like students need a little bit more experience with these stories, especially if you want to be a working journalist. You need to know these stories. So this digital project was a way to give the students some history but also tie it to the present. Because as you'll see, I found like the, the Twitter account of Ida B. Wells' great, great granddaughter. She's raising money to establish a memorial in Chicago for Ida, so that's up there. So students can see like how it's history, but it's not over yet. So I tried to use this project as a way to explain the history, but also make it now make it present and make it 2018 and make it relevant for them. So what I'm gonna do for you guys today is give you an overview of the territory that I'm covering with the digital project. And then I'm gonna show you some of the highlights of some of the stories there. And then we're gonna end with you all hearing from the students who worked with me on this project. Um, I had, the, it's a writing for TV and radio class that helped me with this. So I wanted them to get their hands on a camera, at, near the end of the semester after they'd done their research, they interviewed one another about their research so they could get some hands-on experience interviewing, working with a camera, and then I edited it into like little bite-sized clips, like just enough to pull a student into a story because they're not gonna watch it like a 10-minute video. So I just made little bite-sized nuggets to pull you into the story and to let you hear the voices of the students explaining what this all meant for them. So this is the overview. When I first started researching the history of African-American journalists, this is a quote that really, really resonated for me. And even in 2000, whenever I teach this part, students always take a moment and let these words sink in. We wish to plead our own cause. For too long, others have spoken for us. And that was the reason Russ Roman Cornish in 1827 established the first African-American newspaper, Freedom's Journal. One of the nice things about the website, in a textbook, you would just have the text on the page, but here, I can take you straight to uh, a digitized copy of Freedom's Journal, which I'm gonna do right now. So it's a way of giving the students the information, but then giving them something that's sort of tactile, something that's now, to pull them, to pull the story into their present day lives. Like this is online, and as we'll go through this, this um, site, you'll see that I have links to digitize archives. So this is a present day living things. Not over, it's not done just because it's history. So the page starts, first page starts with sort of an overview of African American journalists with links to those sites. Uh, 
um, this recently, like when the past four weeks, the New York Times kind of had a come to Jesus moment and decided that, yeah, you know, they wanted to kind of apologize and kind of, you know, you know, atone for some of the ways in which their obituaries didn't acknowledge everybody who led lives of accomplishment. One of the people, so they went back and they wrote obituaries for people who had been overlooked. To my journalistic heart, that made me happy. One of the people they included was Ida B. Wells. So I have that uh, included in this website as well so students can see this is not, like the story didn't die with Ida. It's still here, it's still going on. So the page, and I'll flip through them for you. Actually, if I can just do that. Yeah, there we go. So uh, the website takes you through like a visual history of African-American journalists in the United States. And, and we touch on Canada with Mary Shad Carey. You covered some of this territory as well in your speech earlier. But 1827, we have the first African-American newspaper Freedom's Journal, it always blows students' mind that this even happened, because so many times they get to my class and they've never, never even heard of this. And so I like to start here and with this website. Again, another archive copy so students can see what it looked like. And just see for comparisons purposes, like the vast difference between newspapers then and newspapers now. Nobody but me and my grandma reads a paper, probably. But students, I think, can still appreciate the difference between like how far newspapers have come from text that looks like this to what we have now, the colors, the photographs, the headlines, all that stuff that we talk about in Children Mass Comm. So I think something like this makes it more real for students. Um, and also, um, John Brown Russworm, one of the co-editors of this paper, went to Bowdoin College. They've actually set up an African-American center in his honor. One of the things you can do with the website, again, pick up students, take them right there, so you can see the center that's set up in his honor. That's the university that he attended, the first African American to graduate from Bowdoin. The newspaper lasted for two years. Of course, you know, its mission was clear. They wanted to speak for themselves. They didn't care for the way they were portrayed in, in non-African American newspapers at that time, which tended to only write about black people if there was a crime or something related to slavery. So the Freedom's Journal wanted to branch out. They wanted to have stories of marriages, of births, of accomplishments, of deaths. The story of African Americans in this country wasn't just somebody was sold and somebody committed a crime. And they were very clear, that's our mission. We are advocacy press. So here's a, the Wisconsin Historical Society has all 103 issues online digitized. It had a two-year lifespan for the paper, 103 issues all digitized right there. One of the fantastic things about this digital project is that beyond just telling students, hey, this newspaper existed, they can start clicking through it and looking at the headlines, looking at what made news back then, and reading the stories that people were telling about themselves rather than leaving it up to someone else. So that was in 1827, Russwoman Cornish. There's also some biographical information um, that I've put in there as well for those who wanted to, students who wanted to take a look at it. Oh, and one more thing at the bottom. I love the uh, ability to pick up a student and take them right to the scene of history. This is the house that Russworm lived in. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's right there. You can go to Maine and take a look at it. So I like to put that little detail in there so students can see that for themselves also. So after Russ Roman Cornish came along, this is where students nod their heads when they see this guy's photo. Everybody knows who he is? Nod your heads. Yes, Frederick Douglass. Everybody has some passing familiarity with him. A lot of students are surprised to find out, though, that he was a journalist. They'll know the escape from slavery part, but they don't know the he started a newspaper part. It's called, you know, of course, the North Star, one of the most influential newspapers. Here you can see what it looked like, digitized copy again, gives students a, a different perspective of the newspaper instead of just reading a paragraph saying, uh, Frederick Douglass started the newspaper. And to make it a little more relevant, a little more present for students, just three weeks ago, his great-great-grandson was at Chapel Hill delivering a speech. And he was on WUNC. So guess what? You can click here and you can listen to his great-great-grandson talk about their efforts to keep his memory alive, their campaigns, 
It's all right here. And this was just like three weeks ago. I totally geeked out when I heard it. It's like, what? This is going on the website. Makes me so happy. Um, and I also thought this was a neat thing to give students. Just to take a tour of his home. Isn't that fantastic? This is a National Park Service. So you can just casually see what Frederick Douglass's living room looked like. What did his hallway look like? And I thought that was a nice bit of visual interest for students to make this historical person a real three-dimensional figure. So, and students freaked out when they saw that. Like, what? You can tour it? Yes, you can. So that's one of the ways I like to think of this digital project is like an, like an online textbook for the students, really fleshing it out for them. And again, his newspaper was an advocacy newspaper, of course, advocating um, against racism, against lynching, but he also expanded to cover, just like Russellman Cornish, just to show the full humanity of black people in those pages, beyond crime, beyond slavery. One of my favorites, Mary Shad Carey. Not only was she a journalist, a publisher, she was a lawyer, she went to Howard University Law School, like in her 40s. Um, she was just an all around rabble rouser kind of person, my kind of gal. Um, she started the Provincial Freeman in Canada. In just a moment, you can, you'll see the image in 1852. She was born in Pennsylvania and her family immigrated Delaware, sorry, born in Delaware, <laughs> went to Pennsylvania to be educated by Quakers because it was illegal to educate blacks in Delaware, so her family went to Pennsylvania, then they moved to Canada. Her father was elected, to, like Canada was like, if anybody watches The Handmaid's Tale, I kind of think like that's what Canada was in the 1800s, it was like this place of refuge for them. Her father went to Canada, was elected to office, um, she and her family went up there of course, um, after the Fugitive Slave Act, concerned about the way things were going down in America. Their family also was part of the Underground Railroad. And Mary herself returned to the United States to uh, serve as a military recruiter during the Civil War, recruiting soldiers for the Union. Um, and once the war was over, she remained in the United States and decided to go to law school and use her legal knowledge to help um, people who needed legal representation at the time. She also started um, in Canada. She also started an integrated school as well. So this website shows you what the provincial freemen looked like back then. And again, um, students can always see just how much nobody reads a newspaper, but they should totally appreciate the way newspapers look now because we've come a long, long, long way. Her house is also a National Historic Landmark. I didn't know this when I lived in D.C. I would have loved to have stopped by it, but I put that in there. No inside tour, but students can at least see the outside. Again, just making um, a historical figure a little more three-dimensional. And Canada has a marker where her newspaper office is stood. So if students are ever up that way, they can swing by and see it. If not, this takes them there virtually. So I like using the digital project for those little things. Here's a short, short little clip that one of my students made. And um, she was the first African-American woman to become an editor of a newspaper. And also she was the second uh, African-American woman to uh, earn her law degree. During the Civil War, she actually helped to recruit people to fight against the uh, Confederates. I was actually surprised and uh, during the 1800s seeing that, you know, there were actually some women out there uh, in those positions, actually pursuing those positions. And I can see why she actually pursued that position, actually going to law because she decided to go to law after she, after um, the Civil War, basically they were gonna need legal support. To Definitely it was inspiring that she moved to Canada. When she found out that there was a Civil War in the United States, she actually came back to the United States. And that's, that's inspiring. You know, she wanted to be involved. And I think we can all learn to be involved in the issues that are going on within our community and to take action. And he's an aspiring journalist. And I thought it was really important that like the, the next generation of journalists take a moment to reflect on what people have already done and how that can inform the work that they're gonna do when they walk into newsrooms. So that was Mary Shad Carey. Um, I go on to a couple of other papers, The Woman's Era in 1890, um, my personal hero, Ida B. Wells. Um, I lived in Memphis for a while working for a TV station there, geeked out walking by the markers for her. Um, and one of the nice things about this is that 
the uh, Library of Congress has a recording of someone reading the works that she wrote about slavery. So that's a nice way to make the history sort of three-dimensional for students. From Ida B. Wells, we go on to other newspapers, the Afro-American, um, Chicago Defender, which is still operating, still around, not, not gone away. Um, I put a link to its Twitter site, so if any students want to follow them and check them out, their Twitter and Facebook pages are up there as well. And then uh, the Pittsburgh Courier. These were newspapers also, the latter two, that went beyond advocacy, um, um, that went beyond advocacy and talked about education. They talked about housing. The Pittsburgh Courier started what they call a double V campaign, um, encouraging soldiers, of course, to fight for, you know, equality, democracy abroad but sort of pointing out, hey, if you're gonna be fighting for it abroad, we need to be fighting for the same thing here. And that newspaper was a huge part. Women had hairstyles in honor of the Double V campaign. They wore fashion in honor of it. So that shows the ways in which journalists went beyond just sort of recording history, but they were really part of driving, a driving social force in society. They played a critical role in doing that. And then at the end, I had some of my students talk about the ways in which their reflections after learning the stories of these journalists. There's one student talking about the first two. They came with the newspaper called Freedom Journal. Um, it was surprising that the newspaper only lasted two years. I thought it would last longer, but then again, I wasn't surprised that it didn't last longer because of the certain topics that they were talking about, such as lynching black people and political rights and voting rights for African Americans. They knew the risks about the stuff that they were writing and they still went for it just to inform people and try to make a positive reputation for black people. It just makes me feel like no matter what, you have to stand up for your people because not everybody else is rooting for you guys. So you have to stick together and make sure you're the ones who stand up for each other. So all of them had to tape, uh, record their own videos with their impressions. I really thought, number one, it was just important not only to teach them the history so they know sort of the, the footsteps that they're traveling in and it can inform the work they do once they're actually in news, newsrooms and realize that journalism is really a tool for social change. We're historians, we're oral, oral historians, um, and we're, we're the first draft of history. It's, it's some of the stories that I've covered, I, I, I pinch myself like, what, they're paying me to be here, this is crazy. But when you think about the people that who've come, the people who've come before you and the things that they've done, that can really make you aware of the sense of responsibility that you do have and you should have when you're working as a reporter, even in television, it's not just a job um, that's about television, it's about telling a story. And certainly if these people could do it under much, much more dire circumstances than, than we face, or maybe we'll face, who knows how things are gonna shake out in the next couple of years. Um, but certainly if they could do it, then I think, I hope, my hope is that it gives students um, the inspiration, the confidence and the strength that they can do something similar should they ever have to stand up for what's right and know that when they're walking into a newsroom to be there for the right reason, to tell the stories that need to be told in the way they need to be told and to acknowledge the humanity of everybody that you're covering. So that's my goal with this project to impart that to students. So that's my spiel. Thank you.